SpaceX just made a surprising move this past week by announcing its decision to reuse Super Heavy Booster 14 for the upcoming Starship Flight 9. The booster previously made headlines in January with its successful mid-air catch by the launch tower arms during Starship Flight 7. Early Tuesday morning, after completing standard readiness procedures like system integration, checks, inspections, and routine maintenance, Booster 14 left the Mega Bay and made its way to the launch site. Once there, crews carefully lifted and mounted it atop the orbital launch platform, preparing it for the upcoming static fire test. Based on SpaceX's typical practice of using progressively improved boosters for each flight, Booster 16 was expected to fly on Flight 9. However, the decision to reuse Booster 14, which previously flew on Flight 7 in January, came as a surprising move from the company. This decision reflects SpaceX's confidence in the hardware's durability and reliability. It also marks a major milestone toward achieving fully and rapidly reusable starships while allowing the collection of valuable data on booster performance during a reflight. Close-up images of the engine section of Booster 14 revealed something intriguing. The inner Raptor engines showed burn marks, suggesting that they were likely the same engines used during Flight 7. As for the outer engines, they were covered with protective shrouds, making it difficult to confirm whether they were replaced. However, the consistent reusability approach hints that at least most, if not all, of the engines from Flight 7 are being reused. SpaceX's decision to reuse the engines reflects confidence in their ability to perform reliably across multiple flights. By flying the same engines again, SpaceX can gather crucial data on Raptor engine longevity and maintenance needs, advancing their efforts toward rapid reusability. Another striking detail observed was the presence of markings labeled flown hardware on various parts of the booster. This labeling indicates that many of the booster's structural components, such as the chines, electrical and plumbing systems, and other assemblies, are being reused from Flight 7 rather than being replaced. By reusing Booster 14 with minimal refurbishment, SpaceX aims to gather valuable data on performance, component durability, and overall reliability, particularly after exposure to extreme thermal and vibrational stresses during Flight 7. On Thursday morning, SpaceX initiated propellant loading for the static fire test of Booster 14, thanks to the recent upgrades at the tank farm, including newly added cryopumps and supporting infrastructure. The loading process was completed faster than usual. Once fully fueled and ready, Booster 14 fired up all 33 of its Raptor engines for approximately 8 seconds. This powerful burst marked a historic milestone, the first ever static fire of a flight-proven super heavy booster. Reusing the same engines from a previous flight and pushing them to fire together in a static fire test is a big deal. The objective here is to verify that the previously flown engines, along with the booster's complex plumbing, valve systems, ignition mechanisms, and overall engine performance, are all still reliable and ready for the next mission. Even though the engines had already proven themselves during Flight 7, the stresses they endured during flight, landing, and recovery could have caused wear or damage that isn't immediately visible. This test ensures that those engines can withstand another full throttle ignition and perform consistently. Now that the test has been successfully completed, Booster 14 will head back to the build site for final system checks and verification before being officially cleared for Flight 9. Booster 14's partner for Flight 9, Ship 35, is currently inside Mega Bay 2, where it's being prepared for the static fire test. Right now, the engines are being prepped for installation, indicating that SpaceX has likely identified the root cause of the propellant leak seen during Flight 8. This leak, originating from the regenerative cooling channels of the engine nozzles, triggered a fire that led to engine failure and ultimately resulted in the loss of the vehicle. The fact that SpaceX is moving ahead with engine installation suggests that the team has made the necessary design changes to address the leak problem. These modifications will be tested in the upcoming static fire, which aims to recreate the conditions that caused the leak and confirm that the hardware adjustments effectively resolve the issue. In a related development, the FAA recently concluded its investigation into the Flight 7 mishap. The final report found that the main cause of the failure was unexpectedly strong vibrations during flight, which put excessive stress on the propulsion system hardware. This stress caused a feedline failure, leading to a propellant leak and a fire in the attic section which resulted in the mission being terminated. Interestingly, when Flight 8 took place in March, the Flight 7 investigation was still ongoing. However, the FAA approved Flight 8 after confirming that SpaceX had addressed the root cause, implemented corrective measures, and met all safety, environmental, and licensing requirements. The Flight 8 anomaly investigation is still ongoing, 
and the FAA will only grant SpaceX a license for Flight 9 once it determines that the root cause has been addressed and necessary fixes have been made. As SpaceX prepares for Flight 9, work on the second orbital launch pad is progressing at a significant pace. Teams continue testing the Tower B chopstick arms, with recent tests focusing on arm opening and closing to calibrate the actuators. These tests follow the extensive horizontal and vertical movement trials conducted in the preceding weeks. More such tests of the arms are expected in the coming weeks, including water bag tests to evaluate load-bearing capacity before they are deemed ready for rocket stacking and catching operations. Near the launch tower, work on the flame trench is advancing steadily. The first layer of concrete has already been poured, covering part of the trench, and the remaining areas will be filled in the coming weeks. Additionally, Teams have installed flame diverter support structures, five pieces positioned at the center of the trench, on which the diverter will eventually be mounted. Meanwhile, work on the flame diverter itself is progressing at the Sanchez site. Teams have begun drilling evenly spaced holes into the diverter's water channels, which will enable water to be sprayed through them during engine ignition. This water will act as a thermal buffer, absorbing heat, and mitigating the intense acoustic energy produced by the engine exhaust while the diverter itself redirects the plume away from the vehicle and launch pad. Work on the Pad B launch mount is also moving forward at Sanchez, with teams currently focused on integrating water delivery channels into the top deck, crucial for cooling and sound suppression during booster engine ignition. Several months of work remain to complete the flame trench, install and integrate the diverter and launch mount, and bring the launch pad into full operation. On March 28th, NASA made a significant move by officially awarding a launch services contract to Starship under the NASA Launch Services II framework. This program already includes several commercial launch vehicles, including the reliable Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets, aimed at maintaining a versatile and dependable lineup of launch providers. NLS-2 contracts are designed to give NASA access to a flexible pool of commercial launch options for critical missions, including planetary exploration, Earth observation, and various scientific research endeavors. By adding Starship, despite it not yet having demonstrated orbital payload deployment, NASA shows growing confidence in the vehicle's innovative design and potential. The agency is positioning itself to tap into the rocket's immense payload capacity, up to 200 metric tons to low Earth orbit, and its potential to enable cost-effective, reusable spaceflight. Now, let's dive into the latest breakthroughs and developments in science and technology. On March 31st, SpaceX made history once again by launching its FRAM-2 mission from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. This mission is a significant milestone in human spaceflight as it marks the first crewed orbital flight to traverse Earth by as poles. FRAM-2 is also SpaceX's sixth private astronaut mission, highlighting the company's growing role in commercial space exploration. The mission utilized the Crew Dragon spacecraft, Resilience, carried into orbit atop a Falcon 9 rocket. The name FRAM-2 honors the Norwegian exploration vessel FRAM, which played a vital role in Arctic and Antarctic expeditions during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Aboard Resilience is an all-civilian crew of four, each bringing unique expertise to this groundbreaking mission. Chun Wang, a Maltese cryptocurrency billionaire who also personally funded the entire FRAM-2 mission, serves as its commander. Janik Mikkelsen, a Norwegian filmmaker renowned for her work in polar environments, serves as the vehicle commander. Her role includes overseeing spacecraft operations and capturing the mission through advanced imaging technology. This visual documentation is crucial for both scientific analysis and public engagement. Joining them is Rabia Rog, an Arctic robotics researcher specializing in polar science, who acts as the mission's pilot, becoming the first female German astronaut in the process. Eric Phillips, an Australian polar explorer with extensive experience in extreme environments, rounds out the team as the mission specialist and medical officer. About 10 minutes after liftoff, Resilience separated from the Falcon 9's upper stage and entered a polar orbit at an altitude of around 440 kilometers, with a 90-degree inclination. This unique trajectory allows the spacecraft to pass over both the North and South Poles, an orbital path typically used by satellites but never before achieved by a human crewed mission. This polar route offers breathtaking views of the polar regions and opens up new possibilities for scientific research that equatorial orbits simply can't provide. During their time in orbit, the crew will carry out an ambitious set of 22 experiments, combining Earth observation with studies on human health in space. One of the most intriguing objectives is the study of strong thermal emission velocity enhancement, or STEVE, a rare atmospheric phenomenon resembling auroras, 
observed at altitudes between 400 and 500 kilometers. Unlike typical auroras, which are caused by charged particles from the solar wind colliding with atmospheric gases, steam forms due to rapid hot plasma flows within the ionosphere. These flows are driven by strong electric fields generated during geomagnetic disturbances, causing charged particles to accelerate through the ionosphere, resulting in intense frictional heating and producing Steve's distinct purplish-white arc and green picket fence pattern. The mission will also focus on research into the physiological effects of spaceflight on the human body, including capturing the first-ever X-ray images of a human in space. This data is crucial for assessing bone density and potential radiation effects during long-duration missions to the Moon or Mars. Another experiment, dubbed Mission Mushroom, will attempt to grow oyster mushrooms in microgravity exploring sustainable food options for long-duration missions to the Moon, Mars, and beyond. After spending more than 86 hours in orbit, the FRAM-2 mission is scheduled to return to Earth as early as April 4, with a splashdown off the coast of California in the Pacific Ocean. This will mark SpaceX's first human spaceflight to land on the West Coast, adding a new milestone to the company's record. Upon landing, the crew will execute a unique exit procedure. They will leave the capsule unassisted, foregoing the typical medical and mobility support provided to astronauts. This self-exit tests how future crews might disembark on lunar or Martian surfaces, where immediate assistance may not be available, offering valuable data for NASA's Artemis and SpaceX's Starship programs. Overall, FRAM-2 showcases SpaceX's commitment to advancing human space exploration, breaking new ground in polar orbit human flight, while paving the way for future missions to the Moon, Mars, and beyond. German-based ISAR Aerospace made history on March 30th with the first launch of their Spectrum rocket from the Andia spaceport in Norway. The mission aimed to validate the rocket systems and collect data for future flights. However, shortly after liftoff, the rocket encountered a major anomaly that resulted in mission failure. Just moments after leaving the pad, during the pitch-over maneuver, the rocket began to wobble, indicating a loss of stability. The situation rapidly deteriorated as the first stage engines shut down, causing the vehicle to lose thrust and start falling back to Earth. The rocket ultimately crashed into the ocean near the launch site, resulting in a powerful explosion on impact. Fortunately, the launch pad and nearby infrastructure were unharmed. Speculation about the root cause of the anomaly points to several possibilities. One potential issue could be a failure of the thrust vector control system, which is critical for maintaining the rocket's trajectory during the pitchover. Another possible factor could be engine performance problems or structural failure due to aerodynamic stress during the maneuver. Additionally, software or integration errors are not ruled out, considering this was the first integrated flight test. Environmental factors, such as unexpected wind conditions despite earlier weather checks, might have also contributed. ISAR Aerospace is currently analyzing the flight data to pinpoint the precise cause. The company's approach focuses on learning from the anomaly to enhance future missions. CEO Daniel Metzler emphasized that despite the outcome, the mission was valuable in terms of data collection and system validation, especially the successful activation of the flight termination system. ISAR Aerospace, established in 2018, aims to become a leading provider of launch services for small and medium-sized satellites worldwide. The Spectrum rocket, approximately 28 meters tall and 2 meters in diameter, can carry up to 1,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit or 700 kilograms to a sun-synchronous orbit. It features a two-stage configuration, powered by 10 Aquila engines, nine on the first stage producing roughly 675 kilonewtons of thrust, and one vacuum-optimized engine on the second stage. These engines burn liquid oxygen and liquid propane, chosen for their high-density specific impulse and comparatively low environmental impact. The rocket's design prioritizes flexibility and efficiency, using carbon composites and 3D-printed metal components. ISAR Aerospace manufactures around 80% of the rocket's parts and engines in-house, leveraging local technological expertise. The successful liftoff, even with the subsequent failure, marks a milestone as the first orbital launch attempt from continental Europe, excluding the British Isles and Russia. Along with the investigation into the anomaly, ISAR Aerospace is preparing for the upcoming launches of Spectrum, aiming to enhance Europe's space access. The company has secured agreements to conduct launches from both Andia Spaceport in Norway and the Guiana Space Center in French Guiana, broadening its operational reach. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, 
Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.